Okay, great, thank you. Um, we always have to go through that awkward thing now on uh, Zoom of checking that we're <laughs> that we're okay. All right, so hi everybody. Yes, I'm Gretchen Giggin. I work at Palsy. Um, just to get started, I'll tell you a little bit about Palsy. If I can get my slides to advance, there we go. So um, Palsy is a consortium of 70 academic libraries um, all, of all sizes and all types, private, public, small and large. Um, and we're really across the whole mid-Atlantic region. We have members now in West Virginia, New York, and New Jersey. Um, so we do represent a lot of different libraries um, and a lot of different types, but we are a small staff of four. Um, we do maintain a high level of activity among uh, national and international library communities like the ICOLC, which is the International Coalition of Library Consortia. Um, I'm going to talk about them a little bit more today, as well as the Samvera community, another one uh, that I'll talk about, the ReShare or Folio community, and the Open Textbook Network, and that's just to name a few. <clears throat> Our mission is diverse, but it primarily centers around uh, resource sharing services. Um, our Easy Borrow um, is one of them, and Rapid ILL. Um, we also do co cooperative purchasing um, of electronic resources. Uh, we collaborate on shared collection development through things like uh, remote storage, shared serials, digital collections, and disaster planning. Um, and we also uh, sponsor some networking and professional development in the region. And some of you may have been involved with Palsy in um, one or more of these areas. Um, but there's another part of the mission which I'm gonna talk about today, and that's our increasing commitment to engage in research and development activities to increase the technology and infrastructure for the consortial community. So one of the main ways that we're approaching that goal is through participation in open source software projects. Excuse me. <clears throat> So what is open source software? So open source software, very simply, is any software that's distributed with a license that allows any other person to study, change, or distribute the software further. Um, so just like other open movements, like open access, open source software communities uh, think that sharing work openly leads to more innovation and a better project product. Excuse me. So because of this belief, open source software communities usually um, develop a really strong bond and they're centered on developing solutions for problems that arise out of the community and are um, developed by uh, consensus. So they're community owned and they're uh, solutions that we, we need that we're developing for ourselves. Contribution to open source software can take a lot of forms, and that can uh, give actually a low barrier to entry. Contributions can include staff time, both in the actual development, but also in aspects of design and management. Um, they can also be through financial support, but they could also be through the offering of resources to host or provide infrastructure. So basically, members can contribute what they can, and they're not usually required to find extra resources if they don't have them. Finally, work on open source software projects within an institution can increase its capacity for other projects. So the time you might, de de uh, excuse me, the time you might devote in terms of staff resources could create a better end product for you, but it also could increase your connection to the community and possibly increase the skills of staff and the infrastructure you have in your own library. But collaboration does have costs. There's no real guarantee um, on the return on your investment for projects. You can often get out what you put in, though. Um, it's just that the outcome may be different than what you expected. So um, the software may not turn out to be exactly what you wanted, but you can benefit in terms of relationships, skills, and opportunities. And additionally, the consensus-driven approach to building software um, means that the resulting product, product may not meet your exact needs immediately um, because it's gonna come out of consensus of the whole community. Um, the experience of building the software um, is only one part of the project usually. Once the software is released and usable, you still need to uh, lean on the community for help and support. There are businesses that have built their um, services around open source software, but generally it's not like your typical uh, kind of vendor um, situation where you have a support number you can, you can call when there's a problem. 
What this all gets at is that investments are by their nature risks. So if you have to feel tolerant of those risks and you have to have some strategies for mitigating those risks. Um, to make kind of open source software uh, simple to understand, the analogy that a lot of people use, and you may actually have also heard this about open access, is that it's more like a free puppy than a free beer. Uh, beer is immediately easy to enjoy if it's something that you enjoy. If you don't, you could imagine another beverage, coffee. Um, it's easy to enjoy, but it isn't long lasting. Um, the puppy can take a lot of work to raise, but in the long run, the relationship is hopefully a lot more rewarding. So that's where Palsy comes in. By using OSS, open source software, to help increase the technology and infrastructure for the community, we're absorbing and sharing some of that risk. We're sharing some of that burden to raise the puppy um, and, and taking that off of our membership. So I like to think of Palsy in this analogy, and I'm, I'm known for taking analogies to their ridiculous extent. Um, Palsy is like the obedience school for the puppy. We're gonna help you get to that rewarding stage. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about three specific projects um, that Palsy is involved with uh, using open source software. And I'm going to hopefully illustrate for you how Palsy is contributing, um, how our members and how the community is benefiting, and a little glimpse into where we see these projects going. So first up is CC Plus. Uh, CC Plus stands for Consortia Collaborating on a Platform for Library Usage Statistics. So CC Plus is an IMLS funded grant to develop an application for libraries and consortia uh, to gather all their licensed resource usage statistics, um, reports that adhere to the counter standard in one place. So the ultimate results are hoped to be that this will increase libraries and consortial analytic capabilities, which will in turn create staffing and costing, uh, cost efficiencies, and hopefully empower consortia and libraries to make informed decisions about their investments. So from the beginning with CC Plus, we committed to releasing the software with an open license. So in this project, we're actually creating a new community behind this open source software effort. And there was a really good start to building that community. As you can see here, CC Plus is a project, as a project is a really good example of Palsy representing its membership across the profession. Um, the project idea came out of discussions in the iCult community and Palsy agreed to take on leadership of the project, leading the software development team, convening the steering committee uh, and engaging in the official grant management. Um, and we have contributions um, from across the US, Canada, and Europe to this project. Specifically in terms of the software development, um, we put together a what we call product management team. So this is a group of practitioners um, from some of the consortia represented in the project. And this group really gets down to the nuts and bolts and decides what the software is and what it should do. Um, since we're building this tool from a consortia perspective, we don't have individual library staff members on, the, on this team. We have staff from different consortia, um, but the library uh, members are, are involved later on in the process um, as we test it out. Uh, okay. So we used a number of different activities um, to uncover the needs and requirements of this software. So I wanna take you um, a little bit deeper and show you what, it, what it's really like, what we really did to, to, to build the software. Um, so this work was done um, from roughly May to September of last year. Um, so the first thing we did was we started with a survey of those product management group uh, members to get some data to start with. So we asked them questions about how uh, what reports they use most frequently what staff were involved and basic needs for a tool and we followed that up with some small focus groups um, really they were more like user interviews with two to three people um, we discussed their current workflows what their ultimate goals were and what kind of technology support they really envisioned having um, then we simultaneously um, started to map out a uh, structure that the tools would take. So we created diagrams of things like database tables, um, relationships between consortia, libraries, and publishers. And we also looked at workflows for different kind of technical parts of the process. And we analyzed how the counter report format um, 
uh, there was a new format that came out R5 just as we were starting. So we, we analyzed how that compared to um, the previous standard we've been using. Um, then we moved more towards working on more front end related issues. So the first activity was to create a series of user personas that covered um, various access levels, various um, roles and different levels of engagement with the software. Um, and this helped us think through some uh, workflows and a crucial part was figuring out how staff um, within a consortia could have accounts and access to the data that applied to uh, resources that have been consortially purchased while library libraries who are members and librarians there could also have access to data for um, resources that they alone paid and, and subscribed for um, next the process uh, went on to using um, a software to to do a process called story mapping and this is where we we walk through the interaction of using the software from end to end um, and we plot out the users the systems and the data points that would be needed at each step of the process and that eventually led to the first uh, simple mock-ups um, and then on top of that, more interactive wireframes. Um, and these created like a dummy interface so that we could actually test out our hypothesis about how users could accomplish tasks. And finally, at the end of the process, we created a formalized set of requirements. A lot of projects start with requirements and then immediately start building software. And we kind of did this in a different way, um, kind of in a backwards way, so that we knew that the requirements that we ended up with would really be what we wanted. And we could use the requirements list as more of a, a checklist to make sure that our resulting software um, met these needs. So what we ended up with um, is a tool that harvests counter compliant reports on a monthly basis from any vendor that creates them. Um, all of the data is aggregated in a central database, so you can export out reports that are customized um, to include any time span, any vendor, and multiple data facets. Um, it's also designed so that a consortia can set it up for its members, um, so that it can gather data for the resources it purchases as a consortium, while simultaneously offering libraries the chance to add their own additional vendors and data for their own use. Um, so at this point, we have a working alpha release um, and it automatically harvests reports and monitors the success or failures of the harvest um, and the export combined. Um, it creates customized reports for individual institutions and um, it can create uh, reports for all institutions for a consortium and uh, multiple vendors for, for either consortia or libraries. I'm going to um, stop share for a second. I'm just having a slight... Um, just a slight technical issue. Hold on one second, sorry. I apologize for that. Um, I don't know if there's any um, questions that came up in the chat while I just get myself through this. Okay, I'm, I'm where I wanna be, sorry about that. Sorry about that little blip. Um, okay, so um, the project is currently in a testing phase. We're working with 10 institutions, and this is where we're working with consortia and some libraries within our membership. So we're giving them um, like kind of the first chance to get in and use the software and to give us feedback on how to make this better for them. Um, we hope to release what we call a minimum viable product. That's a little bit of jargon in the software development world. Um, usually it's re referred to as an MVP. Um, and we're hoping that'll come out later this year, maybe early of next year. Um, we're also establishing an ongoing uh, community and that is um, developing governance and partnerships. And through that, we're considering a next phase of development actually and possibly getting some additional grant funding. Um, we're also evaluating the feasibility of providing the service to our own PALSI members in the long term. Um, so here's where we talk about that idea of risk again. Um, we could decide that the service actually isn't a viable option for PALSI. So if we did that, what would be the benefit of spending all of this time on it? 
Well, in addition to building this software, the community we're developing is also um, working on presenting a unified response to publishers in support of better adherence to the counter standard. So even if PALSI doesn't adopt CC+, a couple of things could happen. Our individual libraries could implement it themselves because it's open source software. Um, in the long term, uh, or they could also potentially another uh, service or vendor might take the software and, and offer it as a hosted service themselves. Again, they can do these things because it's open source software. Um, in the long term, we actually hope that as a whole, the field will see more consistent usage data from vendors, um, regardless of using this platform or not, because platforms like this and the community that we're developing is creating an expectation of having that standard. So in the end, we think that the risk of putting time into this is worth it um, in the bigger picture. I'm gonna move on to the next project, and that is Haiku for Consortia. And this is a collaborative uh, institutional repository project. So the project came out of a number of conversations between our consortium, PALSI, and another consortium, PALNI, confusingly named, um, in Indiana. Um, and we were talking about the needs for a repository service that could be managed by a consortium. Uh, the goal is really to create something sustainable, sustainable and controllable in terms of cost, but also we want to offer features that our members just aren't seeing in other services. This is a list of values that was created by Palney as they work through what kind of service they wanted. So as I said, something sustainable and controllable, something with true IR functions to compete with things like digital commons, um, a multi-tenant environment, which means that we could consolidate services at the consortium level, but still offer individual tenants with individual theming and branding for institutions, um, something that's open source that allows cooperative management um, the Palni Consortium in particular really works cooperatively to manage a lot of their shared infrastructure services. Um, but we also wanted something that would be supported by service providers and would have a strong community be behind it. Um, something that was future facing, um, that used current technology structure, um, and that also allowed a free flow of data. So like the easy import and export of metadata and objects, something that was user friendly and user centered, um, that was flexible and scalable. And finally, something that could be customizable based on users needs. So um, Palni was working on kind of researching this and, and and what they wanted out of an IR. And Palsy had actually recently participated in a pilot project to test a, a tool called Haiku. Um, so our two consortia decided to work together uh, to try and figure something out. So a little background on the Haiku software, which is what we ended up um, deciding to move forward with a little bit further. So Haiku is a product maintained by the Samvera community, um, and it's one of their three main products, Haiku, Hyrax, and a tool called Hi Avalon. Haiku is a standardized installation of all the basic tools um, that are in their products, um, particularly in the Hyrax repository software. So it's a standardized package of repository software. Um, so it's supposed to be easy to use out of the box, and it's meant to meet the largest possible set of needs. So with Hyrax, you can be incredibly customized, and you can do it uh, all kinds of great interesting new things, but you have to have pretty heavy development uh, support. Haiku is a, is a kind of simplified version of Hyrax that you can just run out of the box. Um, you don't need to adjust the underlying tools. It's installed and configured as a single application as opposed to Hyrax, which is like a stack of three different tools. Um, and it can support the hosting of multiple tenant repositories. Haiku for Consortia is what we're calling our IMLS-funded project uh, to enhance Haiku with more tools and features for consortia to collaboratively manage repositories together. So we're working with a software development firm called Notch8, and we're developing a product called Haiku Commons, um, which will be an, uh, a hosted IR service uh, for multiple libraries. The Palni Consortium is leading the effort to manage that product and is actually offering it to their members starting this summer. So 
uh, throughout our Haiku for Consortia project, um, we'll be considering whether or not to open that particular instance uh, to other libraries and other consortia. The ultimate goal of the Haiku for Consortia project is to develop a model and a software that will enable, as we said, the low cost, the shared infrastructure, and the collaborative workflows. For this project, we also created a product management team. So that helps us design requirements for the, the features we decided to implement. Um, and this team has members from both Palni libraries and Palsy libraries. Oops, sorry. Um, the features we're specifically going to add to Haiku during the course of this are tools to support collaborative workflow, which I will actually talk about in a little bit more depth, um, six theme templates for different uh, look and feel and some different functionalities in the different ones, depending on what kind of repository you want to create. Um, specific uh, what are called work types in Haiku, which really reply to refer to like metadata template and, and sort of object modeling for ETD and OER, Open Educational Resources. Um, we're going to develop some integration with DOI services to be able to create DOIs for new resources. Um, and we want to share those things back with the larger Haiku community, for sure. That's very important to us. It's the whole spirit of it being open source. We also might, if we have time, work on cross-tenant searching. So you could search across the tenants for all the libraries and sharing tenants between works for like shared um, exhibits or something like that. So the process that we're using to flesh out the features into um, requirements uh, begins with gathering data from the project management group uh, on their needs and their workflows, um, analyzing that and developing plans, and then sharing those plans back and revising them with the product management group. And then we go on to work on the development um, with a, a separate development team that involves the people at Notch 8, and we create specific tickets for the work that break it down into uh, like concrete things that you can do to develop these features. And we coordinate the priorities for working on those tickets with the, with the development team, and we work in biweekly sprints. So this is similar, I hope you're seeing, to the CC Plus project, I mean, especially in those first three steps. We're working with our library members using some of the kinds of tools and activities to uncover what it is we need to build. So um, as an example for collaborative workflows, we started with our product management team, asking them to describe the collections they'd like to use Haiku for. What kind of resources, where did they come from, who uploaded it, who created the metadata, et cetera, to just really kind of explore what it is we need. From those we created, uh, workflow scenarios to help us think through different ways that different uh, permutations of how it might be used. Um, we came up with a series of user roles, which we described in a narrative, but also in a matrix comparing uh, kind of who could do what and where. Um, and then we created this landscape views of how the tenants and the roles might work together within a consortium. And out of this, we came up with the idea of creating some dashboard tools to allow the consortia repository administrator at the top to be able to assign users to roles across multiple tenants um, without having to go into each tenant and, and assign roles there. Um, so though that big idea was then broken down into the idea of tickets, discrete bits of work um, that would allow us to accomplish that goal. Um, so we work with the development team then to plan in two week iterations, all of the tickets that we wanna be able to handle um, to create the work. Um, we're also kind of balancing um, fixing bugs that are in the existing software with that new development. So a lot of these tickets that you're seeing right now um, kind of refer to bug fixing. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But that's a taste of what the development process is and how it'll continue to be for the next few months as we work through the rest of the features on our list. Um, this is a look at what Haiku uh, Commons currently looks like um, and will look like once it's live. Um, and this is just a taste of kind of what the interior looks like. So this is a little tenant I created as a test for Palsy. So I can use Palsy logos, Palsy colors, um, and we're going to do some more work to allow you to customize what this looks like and how it works um, even more. Uh, this is a look at an OER work type. So this is a, a case where we were able to create metadata 
like really tailored to this kind of resource. So you can see some of the some of the uh, elements like learning resource type, education level, um, audience discipline. Those are all really education focused. So the Haiku for Consortia project um, is going to be extended through next summer. Um, at the moment, we're working through this iterative design and development uh, sprints with Nachi, our developer. Later this fall and into the spring, we're going to do some cycles of testing and feedback with our product management team. Um, and with the information from those, that will come back and help uh, develop both uh, further iterations of design and development on the tool, but also a governance and a business model that will work for our consortium. So we have seven policy libraries actually um, currently testing our, our current iteration of the service. Um, so as I mentioned, the Haiku Commons service, um, we're going to actually run uh, as it is uh, and, and with, some, with some pilot libraries, mostly in the Palni network, um, to start to see how that goes while we're also developing these big, uh, bigger features like I was talking about. Um, so once again, the risks that we're taking with the investment in this project have dividends um, beyond just, you know, Palsy being able to offer this service. The features we're developing are going to be shared back with the Haiku community and will become standard features in future releases of Haiku. So that means that other libraries and consortia can benefit from those changes and other vendors can offer services similar to the one that, that we're developing. So if our policy members want the service, we then could have the option of hosting it ourselves if we find that that's a feasible option, but we could also help them say, negotiate a contract with a vendor like Notch8, our development partner who is already offering a service to host Haiku repositories they call Haiku Up. Um, so it's creating uh, benefits across the whole library landscape that won't necessarily um, depend on just Palsy offering the service. So once again, we feel like the risk is, is returning on the investment, maybe not as you might expect, as, as in it will definitely offer the service, but uh, in, in lots of other um, ways. The last project I'm going to talk about this morning is ReShare. Um, ReShare is part of the Folio project, which is an open source ILS project. Um, ReShare is the interlibrary loan part of the system. So ReShare can seamlessly integrate with a Folio ILS, um, but it's independent and can be run as a standalone service with other ILS as well. <clears throat> ReShare is based on Folio's app concept, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. Um, it's also built on open source protocols that the commercial market has been pretty slow to embrace. Um, and it's built on a solid cycle of in-depth research, prototype development, and testing in the field. So the core concept is that the app should be flexible enough to, fill, to fit uh, multiple organizational workflows. So Palsy and its membership has been involved in a lot of parts of this process. Um, we have staff at member libraries um, acting as subject uh, matter experts involved in site visit testing, um, and we have Palsy staff members on the steering committee. So here's um, some images from some site visits at NYU and the New School. Um, so in these cases, developers actually recorded and watched and listened to staff performing their normal duties to better understand the needs of the project. Um, so this probably sounds familiar. This is the same kind of work that we took undertook in these other open software, um, open source software projects. Um, I wasn't involved in this design um, part of the process, so I'm not sure all of the different kinds of, of things they did, but Palsy libraries were right there um, as part of shaping what these tools would look like. So as I said, uh, ReShare is using Folio's app concept. So it's composed of a couple of different apps for different parts of the ILL process. And you can use what you need to fit your, your workflow. So if you want to use supply and request but don't want to use shipments, you don't have to. Or if you want to use um, box and unbox but you don't need to use send and receive, you, you don't have to do that. 
Um, so some key apps that we're working on at the moment are a shared index of holdings from all of the participating libraries. So all of the libraries in PALSI, we're hoping to get a shared index of all of their holdings. Um, and that's useful for ILL for being able to see what's available where, but it's also useful for shared collection development and print retention. Um, and it could be made publicly available if the libraries wanted to as a, a shared resource to know what you could get through interlibrary loan. Um, we're also working on the request and fulfillment apps, um, and these are built out and they're ready for um, testing as a minimally viable product. Our goal with that MVP um, is to do no harm. So compared to our existing service, we wanna offer at least parity with what we already have. But you can see that even the MVP product that we're building offers more functionality and a better um, experience than what, what we're currently offering. So this summer, uh, the PALSI staff is increasing our time on the project to also run a pilot with a couple of PALSI libraries. Um, we have four libraries that are representing um, a couple different ILS, I think at least three different ILS, and they're working with us to test the service. So staff at these libraries are gonna help us identify bugs, identify workflow issues, um, gaps in the software. Um, they're also helping us work through integrations with uh, related uh, discovery services, um, ILL management, and authentication systems. So as I mentioned, PALSI is already pretty heavily represented in several aspects of the project, and we'll continue to work on them to build out the product further um, past this summer's work. Um, we're also, in addition to the pilot, as I, I mentioned a little bit, um, some of the work um, to uh, build out those integration with other library services are actually happening with our PALSI libraries in, um, in, in, collaboration with libraries in other consortia um, in you know other parts of uh, the country um, so we're helping to kind of bridge the gaps and coordinate that work between those libraries we're planning to hopefully fully migrate our library resource sharing service to reshare by next spring so even however those libraries that aren't part of our service and not all part policy libraries are part of our current um, resource sharing um, we're hoping, though, that all of them will, again, benefit from this project in a way. Um, ReShare and the Folio project in general um, kind of feels that its mission is to increase competition in the library market and to increase the um, standard adoption of modern technology and, and modern standards. So they're hoping that by putting a product out there that uh, does have these features, it'll be a push to other vendors in the marketplace to have to compete um, and that that will be a good thing. So if nothing else, um, research should be a good influence on the rest of uh, the market for ILS um, and other services. So those were three specific examples of how PALSI is trying to use open source software to really serve our members, but to also serve the library field in general. But why PALSI? Um, why does PALSI think that it's in the best position to do these things? Well, first, as we all know, libraries are really facing an increasing number of large challenges that they can't take on alone. As a result, um, there are more and more organizations that are being developed to work in specific areas, also using a membership-based funding model. But library budgets can really only go so far. The increase and overlap between these organizations means that too little funding in the first place gets spread too thin. Um, I like this tweet from Susan Parker, um, the li university librarian at the University of British Columbia. Um, in the third sentence, she says, each may be a great thing we want to support, but this approach without further or mutual planning leads to a lot of destabilization. So at PALSI, we're trying to leverage our already successful network of relationships to deepen the collaboration we engage in and to build on it for a greater return. 
Halsey can also use diverse funding models, including um, outside grant funding, to extend the reach of the fees that members pay. So membership creates a stable organization and gets a kind of baseline of services, but because we have that stable organization, we can then manage grant projects without uh, fear of dissolution when the grant funding ends. We can absorb the overhead of the grant management and allow members to contribute where they have the most impact. So we think that allows the consortium to take on the risk to try and develop these services um, by and lighten the, the load of risk on the members. They don't have to just put in all of that investment themselves. Because um, as remember, you know, any investment of resources is inherently a risk. So um, working together, uh, we can uh, lighten the load for all, and we hopefully increase the opportunities for all, even if the specific software doesn't specifically get um, uh, launched at Palsy, um, it will hopefully, you know, raise the bar for other um, tools out in the community, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. So I want to wrap up then um, by bringing this back to, <clears throat> excuse me, the personal level um, and talking about why I think collaborations like these are worthwhile for you to pursue, whether they're with us at Palsy or not. Um, I hope I've shown today that open source software in particular can be a great opportunity for collaboration, but any collabor collaborative profit, um, collaborative project increases your opportunities to respond to current and emerging needs. Collaboration also increases the sustainability of solutions and eases the risks. So if you get the opportunity um, to be involved in a project, you could possibly um, invest a small amount of your time, but get a large return for your library. Um, <clears throat> And I'm looking at my notes and I realize I must not have um, put this in here, but I also hope that you notice that in all of these projects, they're all technology projects, they're all software projects, but we engaged librarians um, in these projects with all kinds of skills and abilities. It isn't, you don't have to be a techie uh, to be involved. In fact, we really need you to be involved and to tell us about what it is you do and what it is you need to help us design these solutions to, to really you know, solve problems. Um, I like to say that I'm, I'm like the worst counterfeit <laughs> librarian because I've never worked in really any of the traditional services. I've done reference in special collections um, and I've done a little bit of processing in special collections, but I've mostly worked in technology projects. So I need you, I need you who do the, the traditional work, who do the, the, you know, recognizable librarian work to tell me what it is you need and how you need these systems to work. Um, and, and finally, um, collaboration isn't just limited to consortia. I mean, I represent a consortia, um, but you know, librarians are really good at collaborating, obviously, um, you know, especially as academic uh, librarians, you know, we've never met a committee, we've never met a problem that couldn't be solved by committee, right? So we're really good at working together. Um, and I hope that this uh, morning might have inspired you to think of collaboration on open source projects as another opportunity to do that and also to see that sometimes the benefits, uh, the return on these investments are uh, broader than uh, what just on paper we're there to do. Okay, so thanks. That's all my slides. Um, I'd be happy to take some questions if there are any and thank you all uh, for letting me gab at you. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. I've unmuted everybody, so if you have questions, please ask away. Hi, uh, this is Amber Aiken. I have a quick question. Sure. I was wondering if it might be possible for us to see a demo of any of these products, or if there's one that exists, if we could maybe get the yeah. link so that we could see how they function. Sure. If you go to, I'll put in the, um, I'll put in the chat here, um, haiku for consortia, consortia.org. Um, on the uh, news section of that, the blog, there's a video of a demo of haiku. So we do have a demo of haiku out. Reshare, I don't know what the um, URL is, but Reshare has a YouTube channel with demo, with video demos. So if you um, just Google search for Reshare and find their, their page or their YouTube, um, they do uh, new videos pretty frequently, um, demoing their new um, 
their new uh, functionality. Sorry, uh, it's kind of early still. Um, <clears throat> in terms of CC+, we don't yet have any kind of demo or anything out. We do have a uh, we do have a blog for that, which is actually currently in under development. The logo that's up there right now is not is not the one we decided on. Um, there are some links there to some documentation um, for some of those like initial diagrams and things like that. Um, we're currently in the testing of what we would call an alpha release, so we haven't done any um, any like demo videos of it uh, at yet any like demo videos of it yet um but hopefully we'll be doing more of that like more promotion of it in the fall as we have an mvp available um yeah that looks like project reshare's um website thank you thank you very much anybody else well then i'd say Stop we're sure. Oh, uh, Jill, my colleague at Pelsey, put up a uh, link for a demo um, for reshare. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much, Jill. That's perfect. Thanks, Gretchen. Yeah. And thank you, everybody. Um, Gretchen, do we we have your email so that if anybody I, else has questions? It's just Gretchen at Pelsey.org. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. If you're one of our Palsy members and you're interested in one of these um, projects, you can uh, let me know. I see somebody just said thank you from Ford City. I'm a Katanning native myself, but my uh, my mom's from Ford City, so I won't hold that against you. <laughs> you're friends with uh, Sarah. I don't know which Sarah you're talking about, but. Oh, my cousin Sarah Green. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I wondered. <laughs> um, small world. Um, but thank you, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And we have uh, recorded this session, so it will be sent out later. And it's also on our YouTube channel whenever we get it there, which will be a little later today. Um, if you have any more questions, just just hit Gretchen up at her email account and. Um, we're going to go get some coffee for the next session. We'll still be starting at 11. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we'll be starting our next session at 11 o'clock. So we have about 17 minutes before then. So as, as Rhonda said, go ahead and grab some coffee, take a restroom break, and we'll see everybody back then. Um, our first presenter when we get to that point in time will be Kelsey Coles. And um, so we'll be doing lightning rounds from 11 to 12.